and then everyone will get a notification as they're coming in that the um, the meeting's being recorded and they can choose to join or not join if they have any strong feelings about that. Okay. Is everybody feeling ready? Everyone got their bio break in? All good. Awesome. Well, that's great. Okay, I'm going to, um, everyone can see my screen okay? Yes, it's looking good. Wonderful. Okay, well, uh, start letting folks in and we're Liz you'll go through the drill of just inviting people to put their their name in the chat and so on I um, mean if you yes. could really emphasize um, to stay muted because of the super large number um, that would be awesome I will you bet awesome. thank you all right here we go good morning everybody We've opened up the room a, a little bit early just to uh, allow people to, to settle in and we'll get started uh, at 1030. So we're just uh, welcoming you all here. My name is Liz uh, from United Way. Uh, we'd love for you to share uh, who you are in the chat box, your name, organization, where you live in Alberta. And uh, we will get started uh, at 1030. So as we're waiting, please do share uh, if you're able. Um, introductions in the chat box, who you are, organization, where you live in Alberta. And as I said, I'm Liz from United Way, just uh, welcoming you all here and we'll get started at 1030. It's great to see so many people joining already. We're expecting uh, a pretty large crowd and uh, really looking forward to today's conversation. So uh, for those of you who are just uh, joining in now, um, we'll get started officially in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm Liz from United Way, welcoming you all and inviting you to share your name, your organization, your, your location in the chat box, um, any networks that you're involved in uh, related to caregiving and the organizations, and uh, just kind of saying a general hello as we build our, um, our community practice here together, our community group together. So thanks to those of you who started doing that. We've got a couple of minutes and we'll get started once uh, everybody has arrived. So, so good to see people coming from all over the province, especially during uh, you know, these times. Uh, uh, so great to see you all. Because there's so many of us here, I also invite you to mute yourself. Uh, we have it set up as, as a meeting format uh, versus a webinar uh, because of, of our community of practice uh, focus. Uh, with that, you do have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. So just please keep yourself muted, uh, but please feel free to put your video on if you like and give a wave here uh, to, to, to share your hellos. So we're starting in about a minute here. Lots of people rolling in, and as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, we are welcoming people to add their, their name, their location, uh, any organizations or networks they work for, work, work within. Um, if you're here as a volunteer and advocate, uh, just you know, say hello in the chat box, and we are um, thrilled to see people from all across the province here. And we'll get started in uh, just a minute at 10.30 making sure that uh, people have a chance to get in and get settled, get their tea or coffee. <laughs> it's fascinating to see who's here in the chat box. I'm just taking a look and we really are from all over the province. So we're at 1030 now and uh, we'll officially begin. So uh, welcome everybody to the Caregivers Group Launch on CORE. Uh, my name is Liz Schweitzer and I am with United Way of Calgary and Area and part of the CORE Alberta team. CORE stands for Collaborative Online Resources and Education and it's a newly launched digital knowledge hub for the community-based senior serving or CBSS for short 
sector um, of organizations and allied agencies and individuals in Alberta. And we are guided by the CBSS Leadership Council. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the CBSS sector uh, work underway in just a moment. Uh, but I'd just like to start by welcoming everybody and uh, to say if you have any technical or administrative issues uh, or questions during the forum, please send a private message to Mariam el uh, and we'll try our best to help uh, during this time. So as you can see, people are sharing uh, in the chat box their name, their organization, where they're coming from, from all across the province. Uh, such a huge interest in, and need in this area. So uh, please start to develop this community here together uh, via the chat box. And uh, I would like also to begin um, very importantly with our land acknowledgement here as we uh, come together in this virtual community space. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work and play on Treaty 6, the traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis settlement and Métis Nation of Alberta, regions two, three and four. We honor and acknowledge the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, the Bigani, the Tsutana, the IRA Nakoda Nations, and the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 regions of Southern Alberta. We acknowledge Treaty 8 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree and Dene. We acknowledge that this territory is also home to the Métis settlements and Métis Nation of Alberta, regions one, four, five, and six within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. And I'd like also to make sure everyone is comfortable with a few brief housekeeping items. So we have set this up for uh, some interactivity. So everyone is able to mute and unmute yourselves and to turn your videos on and off. We ask please that you do mute yourself unless you are sharing a comment or question during the specific discussion period that will come up later on. I'd also like to draw your attention to the bottom of your screen where you can see the participants and the chat icons. If you click open the participants panel, you'll see an option to raise hand. So later on, we will be inviting people to click on that when they want to speak to help us manage the conversation. Also, if you click open the chat box panel, uh, with so many of us here, we're already seeing lots of activity um, in the chat box here. So we encourage everybody who is able during our time together to be really active in this chat box to share resources, comment and build community. Uh, Tristan Wilm with Caregivers Alberta and Shannon Januski with Calgary Seniors Resource Society are moderating the chat box. So thank you to them for, for their efforts there. And thank you to all of you who've joined us. Uh, the session is being recorded and the webinar link will be shared via email and on Core Alberta after the, the session, along with uh, the PowerPoint slides and the resources, uh, some of the key resources shared. So if you, if you feel like you've missed something, uh, don't worry, you will be receiving this um, as an email afterwards with all this information. We know some organizations have Zoom blocked, sometimes connections are unstable, which can cause some glitches. So the backup option is for you to use the call in number so we see people have called in and we'll try to make a pause uh, during the discussion forum for people on the phone. And the host for today's session, and one of the group leads for Core Alberta is Jonah Lawther from Caregivers Alberta. And just before we turn it over to Jonna to take us through the session, um, we would like to talk a, just a little bit briefly about the, the um, work underway for the CBSS sector. So I will turn it over if, um, if Lisa's uh, been able to get in, I'll just uh, pause for a moment to see if Lisa Stebbins, Director of uh, Intergenerational, um, Multi-Generational Wellness and Community, and one of the Community-Based Senior Sector Leadership Council members who's leading all of this work for um, the sector development is in the room to give us an overview to see if she's here. And if not, I will jump in. Yes? Hi, Liz, I'm here. 
you think we'd be used to technology by now, but anyways. <laughs> So um, welcome everyone. Uh, it was so exciting for us to hear uh, about um, this um, uh, webinar or community of practice. And, and I know many of you um, that have signed up, it, it was great to see really high numbers and I hope you have a, a great experience here today. Um, just before we got, get started, um, for those of you that weren't familiar with CORE or the community-based senior sector initiative, we wanted to just give you a, a brief uh, uh, overview. Um, so back in about 2018, we learned about some work that was going on uh, in BC uh, with the United Way of Lower Mainland um, that had um, established a community-based senior sector in BC and um, several initiatives uh, that had come from that work that was very interesting to many, us, many of us here in Alberta. So last fall in 2019, um, four partners, um, CARIA, the agency I work for, uh, which is located in Calgary, SAGE, um, which is a senior uh, serving organization in Edmonton, um, the Edmonton uh, Seniors Coordinating Council, and uh, Age Friendly Calgary partnered to do some engagement sessions across the province last fall. And so um, about this time last year, we were, we were traveling around looking at uh, gauging the interest uh, to, to become more coordinated as a sector, learning about the strengths um, of the sector and uh, collecting information about ways people might wanna collaborate um, and so uh, the four organizations uh, kind of see ourselves as catalysts to this work um, to get things started. And we really wanted um, to make sure that uh, developing a community-based senior sector in Alberta was very community driven, that it was um, agencies uh, and groups across the province that serve seniors that were really part of its development. And so from that uh, engagement session, uh, those engagement sessions, we created a report called uh, What We Heard, uh, which is can be accessed on, on the core platform. And we were um, well uh, on our way to, to advance some of the work based on what we had heard across the province. And then, uh, as many of you know, uh, COVID happened in March uh, of this year. And um, we kind of had to take a look at um, how that the pandemic had influenced um, the, the ways we were gonna advance this work. And so um, some of the development of the sector, which we really wanted to be a, a very um, collaborative and um, a community development based approach, up was put on hold, um, but um, we were able to quickly advance um, some other pieces of the work uh, from that, uh, what we heard report, and develop uh, the collaborative online resources uh, and education site um, that, um, that Liz uh, spoke about in terms of core Alberta. And so in very short order, um, we worked very closely with um, the United Way of Lower Mainland, um, the United Way in, uh, of Calgary and area stepped in to be a lead on the project. And we were able to launch um, core Alberta with a really focused uh, information sharing about COVID and resources around COVID. Um, but over time, really see this developing into uh, communities of practice and a, uh, a one place for community-based organizations to go and get information and learning opportunities. So um, if you haven't done so already, we're really encouraging people to sign up um, to be part of Core Alberta. Uh, it's a very simple process. Um, and as part of that membership, it's um, you will get uh, newsletters and information about different events coming up. Um, it is free uh, and um, uh, you just really have to go on the site and register as a member. So I'm um, really happy to see all of you here. Welcome. And um, uh, please keep track of the work uh, on Core Alberta as we uh, move forward to build a community-based sector in Alberta. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that. Uh, that's wonderful. And uh, now I would like to invite our, our host, uh, John Lowther um, from Caregivers Alberta, who will uh, take us through uh, this uh, really um, 
great uh, rest of the day that we have together. So Jonah, over to you. Thanks, Liz. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It is exciting to see the number of people who have joined to participate in this discussion. And I hope you really will participate in the Q&A after our guest speaker presentations, because that's what this event is all about, hearing what you have to say around caregivers' needs and challenges you see in your line of work. So as we go through the presentation today, uh, please yeah, use that chat box, the raise hand feature to engage with us at any point. As Liz shared, uh, I'm Jonna Lowther. I am with Caregivers Alberta, a nonprofit that serves the entire province of Alberta. Our mission is to empower caregivers and promote their well being. And our vision is an Alberta where caregivers are valued and supported. So it's pretty exciting to see by the number of people who have joined the session that we're not the only ones who have uh, that mission and vision. So, again, thanks for being here. I'm just curious who we have with us today. So, we're going to launch some polls. Um, to just ask, you know, what region, which some of you have already put that in the chat box, but what region are you um, joining us from? So you'll have some polls pop up uh, across the screen to, uh, to share that information and just choose, choose that selection, whether you're in a rural area, an urban area, are you with the First Nations community? what health zone are you in, you know, just share some of that information with us just as a general background piece. And we'll give everybody a second to to sort of fill that out. Thank you for everyone who has put their name and organization and um, more specific, uh, like the town or the city that they're joining from. It's really great to see the variety of people just everywhere all over Alberta. So thank you for sharing all of that. And we have our results being shared with us right now. Excellent. Thank you, Miriam. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, another, another poll to ask what type of organization you are with. Again, these, these polls are more, more vague. We're just trying to sort of like categorize uh, who's, who's with us today. So if you'll please share what type of organization you're with. Um, whether that's a senior serving community organization, do you consider it, uh, are you with healthcare, are you with government, social services, justice, housing, caregiving, what, whatever it is. If you could just click one of those boxes that best aligns with the work that you do or the organization that you're with, that would be fabulous for us. And we'll give everybody just a second to do that. A lot of people in the healthcare sector joining us today. Well, that's exciting because I think that um, we, we as, a, as an organization that serves caregiver clients um, do a lot of support and assistance in helping our clients navigate the healthcare system. So that's really cool that there's a, a large number of people within the healthcare system with us today. So thank you. Um, I think we have just two more quick polls. Um, what is your knowledge on the subject? So we're discussing caregivers, family caregivers, needs, concerns. Um, where where do you consider your personal knowledge base on this subject to be? Minimal, um, so you're hoping to gain a lot of information out of this, moderate or extensive, and maybe, maybe you're really seeking the opportunity to collaborate and form some relationships through this core um, group, which we hope is true too. So should share that with us for a moment. And um, let's see what everyone had to say about that. Hey, most of us feel like we're in that moderate category. Good, all right, one more poll and then we'll, we'll get to our topic today. Who are you? What, is, what, what sort of role uh, are you serving? So you'll, I think that'll make a little more sense when that pops up there on the screen. There you go. Please select the option that best describes who you are. Are you a professional or a volunteer working with caregivers? Are you both a professional um, and a family caregiver, as in the case of myself and many of the staff members with our organization, we would fit that bill. Uh, maybe you don't work with caregivers, you are a caregiver yourself, um, or you don't work with caregivers but interested in learning more or other. So check that one for us. And that's, that's it, that's the last, last poll we're gonna throw at you today. 60% uh, of us are professionals or volunteers working with caregivers. Well, I would have, that's, that's probably pretty right on par for um, the audience that CORE serves, so excellent. 
Thank you everyone for taking the time to, to fill those out for us. I wanna um, share a minute about the Caregivers Core group. We are exceptionally excited about the opportunity within CORE to educate, support, and collaborate with other organizations to better address caregiver needs. That's why the Caregivers Group within CORE has been created, to bring together members across Alberta to inform, educate, and advocate with each other. The CORE platform can help achieve those collaborative efforts through discussion groups, webinars, training, educational events, just like what you're attending today, and posting resources and collateral useful to supporting caregiver clients within our, our CORE caregiver group. Caregivers Alberta also recently helped form a strategic alliance of organizations in Alberta that is called the Alberta Caregivers Focus Coalition. It is a working group that meets bi-monthly with a commitment to influence areas of improvement in caregiver support. It is our hope that the Caregivers Focus Coalition will also utilize the Caregivers Core Group as a tool for continuing these efforts. So now I will move on to introduce our speakers for today. We are honored to have with us Dr. Jasmine Parmar, an Associate Professor, Department of Family Medicine with the University of Alberta. She is uh, the Medical Lead of Home Living and Transitions for the AHS Edmonton Zone and has worked for the Specialized Geriatrics Program since 1992. Jasneet is very active in developing and implementing clinical programs for the care of the elderly with complex needs and concerns around frailty. Her research currently is focused on supporting family caregivers of older adults by the healthcare system. Joining Jasneet in this presentation is Sharon Anderson. Sharon Anderson has a master's in education in community rehabilitation and disability studies, a master in science and public health and a PhD in family gerontology. She is the research coordinator with Dr. Parmar's Caregiver Centered Care Program of Applied Research, which she has shared a lot of resources in our chat box and links uh, with you all today. Most importantly, Sharon is a family caregiver of her husband, John, since his massive stroke in 1997. Uh, these speakers have some fascinating research to share with you and uh, answers that they hope to get out of you as well through the discussion today. So welcome, Jasneet and Sharon, I will turn it to you. Thank you very much. I've put a link to the full survey in the um, chat box. This is a uh, this is a really exciting project. We'd heard from caregivers in the UK how stressed they were, and we wondered how stressed caregivers were in Alberta. So that's the survey. So there are many names for family or caregivers, um, and even more have emerged in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Essential family caregivers, visitors, essential visitors. But we use a really broad definition of any person who takes on a generally unpaid caring role and provides emotional, physical, or practical support in response to physical or mental illnesses, disabilities, or age-related needs. So pretty much, we think that covers everybody. Thank you to the 604 Alberta caregivers who completed this survey. This is a, a, a good number for a survey. Almost three quarters of you care or the caregivers in the survey cared for one person, um, one in five for two people and almost one in 10 were caring for three or more. Uh, most caregivers were female and they were of all ages. We had um, some as young as 15. All five Alberta health zones were represented. So the real story in this, this um, was, were the differences by care receivers living situation. In this COVID-19 pandemic, family caregivers faced two solitudes. A solitude emphasizes the quality of being detached, separated from others. 
Um, and so certainly we saw that here, the isolation um, that family caregivers were feeling. So caregiving increased for those caring in private homes and those caring for cog um, congregate living res residents were unable to provide care. 73% of the caregivers who lived with the care receiver and 56% of those who were caring for somebody that were living in their own, they were living in their own home in the community were caring more. Um, and by the same token in congregate living, 70% of those caring for an Albertan um, in supportive care were caring less. And 87% of those caring for long-term care residents were, were caring less. By the time this survey was done in July, some caregivers had been designated as essential and were actually providing more care uh, because only one member or two family members were able to enter the residence room and, and care for that residence, feed them, uh, provide that emotional and social support that they were doing, help them get dressed, those kinds of things. So as this quote in green illustrates, in private homes, as programs closed and people were isolated at home, the, those caregivers were overwhelmed with care. This is much more difficult. The help I had developed is no longer able to assist. The few activities I'd set up for my spouse are no longer, for now, anyway, available. On top of this, I also have my son with disabilities at home 24 seven as well. At times, it feels like a dark hole, especially as both are cognitively impaired. The workload, the constant oversight, and especially the lack of stimulation is really difficult uh, now. And in congregate living, the family caregivers who had been spending considerable time were worrying about the resident's health. Um, my husband is a care home and March 13th, I was unable to enter the facility. I'd been spending three to four hours with him in the facility or taking him out on outings outside the care home. My mother is in long-term care. I used to see her four or five times a week for three or four hours at a time. Now, I've been able to see her a few times and only as an essential visitor to feed her when she was quarantined or deteriorating without more care and contact. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the, the, the two solitudes. So this is solitude one. So these are the Albertans who reside in community homes, typically provide about 75 to 90% of the care that folks needing care in the community need. Caregivers who care for someone who lives, who lives with them tend to care the most hours a week before the COVID pandemic and again afterwards. So 37% of the caregivers caring for an Albertan who lives in the same home were caring for 40 or more hours a week. And another 14% were caring for 21 to 39 hours a week. Then during the COVID-19 pandemic, 47% of those caregivers added 21 or more hours a week. 19% um, of the caregivers caring for Albertans who were living in a separate homes, so these, these from the, the qualitative research, tended to be much more um, um, able to, to take care of theirself, themselves for some time. Um, they were, but 19% of those caregivers were caring for 21 hours or more a week and 20% were caring for 10 to 20 hours a week. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, these caregivers added 18% eight, um, added 21 or more hours a week. Now, why is 21 hours a week important? family caregiver distress starts to rise at 20 hours. And caring for someone with depression, dementia, responsive behaviors, or severe impairments increase the, the, uh, the risk of that caregiver distress. Uh, and here I wanna emphasize that family caregiving per se is not stressful. In fact, 88% of the caregivers to older people say they enjoy caregiving. But like any work, when you start to get overloaded with work and worry, it's that, that, it's that overload that causes distress. 
So this is solitude two. Typically, pre-pandemic, family caregivers were providing about 30% of the care to people with frailty, complex chronic conditions and impairment living in private, um, living in, in um, congregate care. And as we can see in the data, about 22% of the family caregivers to supportive living re residents were caring for 10 to 20 hours a week and 16% for more than 21 hours a week. In long-term care, 34% were caring 10 to 20 hours a week and 13% for more than 21 hours a week. Those are those really intensive caregivers. And so here, Jasneet is going to take over and she's going to talk about the health impacts. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Sharon. Um, um, is my video on? Yes, just, uh, yes, we can hear and see you beautifully. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, so what we also surveyed was <clears throat> the impact of uh, the pandemic on caregivers' health and wellness. And unfortunately, uh, the impact has been considerably negative. Both solitudes, caregivers in both solitudes, solitude one and solitude two, reported a deterioration in their physical and mental health. And signs of stress were reported in anywhere from 50 to 80% of the caregivers. And these signs of stress, unable to take a break from caregiving, always thinking about care tasks, feeling frustrated, not sleeping well, are well-validated signs which lead to caregiver distress and burnout. So with mental and physical health deteriorating and overwhelming numbers reporting signs of stress, I believe we have a critical situation in Alberta where our family caregivers are at tremendous risk for burnout. Next slide. So we measured a few very important aspects of mental health. One is anxiety. We know caregiving can cause anxiety and our Caregiver survey also validated what we have found in research previously, that they were anxious, 32% reported anxiety prior to the onset of the pandemic. And then with the pandemic and during the pandemic, we see an exponential increase in caregivers reporting anxiety anywhere from 22% that, that acknowledged low anxiety, we had 78% reporting moderate to high anxiety on a well-validated six-item scale of anxiety. And here is a quote. And the reason we have picked different quotes, we have, we have tremendous amount of comments and quotes from family caregivers. They did not hold back. Here is one on government supports, because this is core platform, and we are going to look at all of us coming together to support family caregivers. And one area family caregivers often report on is financial difficulties. So this quote, I thought, would be prudent to share with you, because we look towards the government for financial support. And here there is a quote which says, this doesn't seem to work. I have personally supported this person at a cost of $1,000 per month for the past year, plus the cost of food, lodging. Every time I try to access government programs, my own anxiety and stress increases exponentially. And what these quotes do is help us understand what is working and what needs to be improved. Next slide. Similarly, what we did was explore loneliness. And this too increased during the COVID pandemic. Why measure loneliness? Loneliness is an indicator of depression, poor health, and premature mortality. It carries the same health risk as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, twice as harmful to health as obesity, and the risk of premature mortality 
is as lethal as alcoholism. 86% reported loneliness on again, a valid, reliable tool that helps identify loneliness. Because we live remotely, isolation and limited resources, always an issue. So you can imagine what it must be like during the pandemic. Another quote, we both need physical touch and to be together. It has been very lonely for both of us and stressful because we can't be closer than six feet in outdoor visits, sad when we've been married many years. He's sad, we can't be together and I'm heartbroken. Next slide. There is much more to this survey and Sharon has posted the link for you. Please do read it and look to see where you could be one, identifying areas that your neck of the woods could be supporting. And also, you can also look at validating what you read in the survey. I have identified a few key points and we have recognized through the survey and other surveys now that are emerging from across the world that this pandemic has significantly increased the challenge for Alberta family caregivers. And a, a caregiver population we have to particularly pay attention to is those family caregivers that are providing care in private homes because they're providing much more care since the pandemic began. And for some of them, it's like, a, it's like working two full-time jobs. We also have to recognize that face-to-face -face family caregiving in congregate care has affected family caregivers as well. It has created anxiety, increased loneliness, affected their mental health, and they worry not just about themselves. It's not just about their suffering, but it is more about what they feel or think or believe is happening to the care receiver in these congregate settings. Not knowing and not being able to be involved in care and wondering who is now providing that care has become a major issue for family caregivers. We recognize that Alberta family caregivers were already providing substantial care before the COVID pandemic. So we have to think of strategies that support family caregivers, not just during this pandemic, but also beyond the pandemic. And we recognize through this survey that substantial number of family caregivers now have had deterioration in their physical and mental health and increase in anxiety and loneliness. And the last point Sharon has already made that family caregiving per se does not cause distress or burnout. The family caregivers are not saying to us that we do not want to provide care. What they're saying to us is that when this care becomes overwhelming, we are suffering and we need support. Next slide. Which brings me to, where do we go from here? We know, we have come to recognize, especially during this pandemic, that we need to support family caregivers. Not just to sustain care, but also to help them support their own health and well-being. We need to acknowledge, and this point is key, that the complex nature of family caregiving and the length of that caregiving trajectory demonstrates to us that no one provider or no one organization can meet all the family caregiver needs. And that is why we need a collective approach. And Core Platform gives us an opportunity to have a collective impact. My plea to you and a pledge for someone who's committed towards this goal is to build a better system to support family caregivers to care 
and also to support their well-being during their caregiving journey. So instead of trying to build better caregivers, let's build a better system around them that supports them. Next slide. I want to give a shout out to many, many organizations across Alberta who are, who've taken on the challenge of the pandemic and who before the pandemic were also doing their utmost to support family caregivers. And lastly, I'd also like to acknowledge all the healthcare providers from within the healthcare system, because I know they try their best whenever they interact with the family caregivers to support them. And of late, there has been much movement within the healthcare system to acknowledge family caregivers when they provide person and family centered care is to take the family caregivers into consideration. We have the use of different tools now in the healthcare system that helps identify caregivers at risk, such as the caregiver risk screen. We are implementing the use of CISNAT, which is a caregiver supports assessment needs tool. Home care evolution is enabling our staff to identify caregivers most at risk and to provide various interventions to support them. And we have recently launched, and Sharon has provided you that link, which is foundational education for all healthcare providers to support family caregivers. So on that note, I'll ask Sharon to move the slide one more time. If you have any questions, please let us know. And we've given you our contact information as well as certain websites for more information. Thank you, Jasmeet, and thank you, Sharon, both of you. We are going to have a, a more comprehensive Q&A uh, after our next presentation as well, so we'll just have one big group discussion. But if you have questions specifically related to Jasmeet and Sharon's uh, presentation, go ahead and type them in the chat box, um, and we want to make sure that we get the opportunity to answer all those questions. So do that. Um, our next presentation is similarly focused around family caregiver needs, but specifically looking at those who are caregiving for people living with dementia. Dr. Gwen McGann is a registered nurse and started her current position as assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary in July of 2017. Prior to that, she was an assistant professor at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and served as the project director for UAB National Healthcare Corporation Partnership which focused on providing education and leadership development for nurses in long-term care. Gwen's research includes using a person and family-centered care lens to develop tailored interventions that target the needs of older adults, including those living with dementia and their family caregivers. Joining her is Dr. Deirdre Mackay. She's an associate professor in the Cummings School of Medicine, Department of Community Health at the University of Calgary. She's previously worked in the United States as healthcare management faculty at the Pennsylvania State University and as program director for graduate programs in healthcare quality and safety at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Dr. McCoy conducts operations research into Canadian healthcare delivery systems to improve patient family outcomes, to help streamline care delivery processes and optimize value within our healthcare system. Her current research is focused on understanding how the COVID-19 pandemic and associated public health measures are influencing care provision and wellness for persons living with dementia and their uh, family caregivers across the care continuum. So welcome Gwen and Deirdre, we'll turn it to you. Thank you very much, Jonah, and thank you for the opportunity to come and share our research on the impact of COVID-19 on family caregivers for persons living with dementia. I'm Gwen McGann. I'm one of the research teams, along with my colleague, Dr. Deirdre McCaughey, and our wonderful research associates, Dr. Whitney Hindmarch and Ms. Kristen Clemens. We wanted to talk today with you about the work that we've been doing around looking at family caregivers for people living with dementia during the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to provide a little bit of context before we go into our study, as we know, um, the Canadian population, like all populations around the world, is aging. 
Currently today in Canada, one in seven Canadians are over the age of 65. That will go up to one in four Canadians over the age of 65 in 2036, which isn't that far away. Um, and as the population ages, we will continue to need more and more family caregivers to provide care for those older adults. In Canada right now, there are 8.1 million family caregivers and proportionately, Canada has one of the largest numbers of family caregivers around the world. In our country, they make up 28% of our population and they contribute a conservative estimate of $25 billion in unpaid care per year. So they are the backbone of our healthcare system and it is our healthcare system is not sustainable without family caregivers. Currently, they provide 70 to 80 or even 90% of the care in the community is provided by a family caregiver for older adults. And as we've heard from the previous um, presentation, it is a very complex role and it has been well documented that it can result in strain and poor health outcomes for the person providing care, but it is not all doom and gloom. There are definitely positive outcomes for caregiving. Um, our older adult family caregivers report uh, an improved sense of confidence, a sense of purpose in their role providing care. And in our previous work, we really looked at the role of resources and hypothesized that resources are important to promote positive family caregiver outcomes. And we specifically look at, um, we work with family caregivers for people living with dementia, and that is the population that our study has focused on. So again, um, dementia in Canada, it impacts over 7% of our population of Canadians over 65. It's characterized by progressive cognitive impairment that makes the person living with dementia become increasingly dependent upon their family caregiver for everyday help with everyday activities. And we were, you know, we're well aware that family caregivers were operating at the limits of their abilities even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, and which has only exacerbated the caregiving situation for many of our family caregivers. And so why did we want to look specifically at older Canadians and those with um, dementia? Well, we've, um, we've learned that older adults, especially those with dementia, are dispor disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Canadians over the age of 65 account for about 24% of the diagnosed cases of COVID, but they account for 70% of the hospitalizations, 63% of the ICU admissions, and over 97% of the deaths occur for um, due to COVID-19 in older Canadians, with 82% of those um, for people that are residing in a long-term care facility. As well, older Canadians are facing restrictions in resources and availability and supports. So learning about all of that, our research team really um, came together with our community partners. And we talked about how do we do a better job of protecting older adults, particularly those with dementia, and how do we support their family caregivers so that their family caregivers can maintain their, in their role as long as possible and be as healthy as possible. So what we did this past summer is we um, looked at examining the impact of COVID-19 and we wanted to look at what are those themes across that continuum of care. So what is happening to the family caregivers? What are those general things that are happening? And then we wanted to also go a bit deeper and look at specifically what are the unique challenges for family caregivers, depending upon where they fall on that continuum of care. So if they're providing care in the community, what challenges are they facing? If their person with dementia is residing in assisted or supported living or a long-term care facility, what might some of those unique challenges be? And we went and we looked at it and we wanted to look at four main areas of four main buckets of information. And so the first one was really around the COVID-19 knowledge. So what was their level of knowledge and what, how are they interpreting those public health messages? 
The next bucket was COVID-19 policies. So how are the public health measures impacting the provision of care? And so our study was conducted in June and July of this past year. And so it was before the um, sort of ease of restrictions um, that happened in the long-term care facilities on July 23rd. So I'll just point that out. The provision of care was another bucket um, of care during COVID-19. So was the care provision different? Were the resources that were available, were they different? Have their needs changed? What new challenges have emerged for them? And then finally, we wanted to look at those outcomes for the family caregiver, as well as the person living with dementia. And it was important for us to understand both how the family caregiver was doing as well as the person living with dementia. We always look at it from a caregiving dyad perspective because each member of that caregiving dyad can have such a profound impact on the other person. And our goal is to bring all of that information together and develop public health recommendations, not only for the current COVID-19 pandemic, but also for taking the lessons that we've been learning over the last several months and applying them to future public health um, emergency planning so that we aren't caught short the way we were this time, taking lessons learned and planning for, for that next, the current wave that we're in um, for COVID-19 and what may happen in the future. So the design of the study, we worked with our community partners so the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary, who generously provided financial support for the study, as well as the Dementia Network Calgary, who were part of our community advisory committee, along with family caregivers, again, who were providing care to a person living with dementia, either at home in the community, in a assisted supported living or a long-term care facility. The online survey was distri distributed through our community partners. And as part of the survey, People were invited to participate if they were willing and interested into participating in follow-up virtual focus groups. And the way that the focus groups were designed, again, were to capture those unique experiences. So, you know, providing um, care in the home or in supported living. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to my colleague, Deirdre. Thank you. So just broadly in a quick brushstroke of who responded to our survey, we did the pilot study in the Calgary area and had 230 family caregivers for persons living with dementia complete the survey. Um, demographics aren't incredibly different than what is seen commonly in this type of research. The average age of the caregiver is 59. It shows a, a broad reflection of ages. Um, we were fortunate that approximately 50% of our group was uh, caring in the community um, and the other 50% had a, their person with dementia living in supportive living or long-term care. Um, as has been mentioned, the burden of being a caregiver is quite high. 27% um, of our respondents told us they were spending more than 40 hours a week providing care. Next slide, please. So in our evaluation of the public health messages, uh, we were really excited to see that 64% of our respondents rated the public health messages that they were um, hearing and receiving as good to excellent. Um, they complemented disease spread, uh, identification of symptoms and information related to COVID as being really strongly communicated areas. Areas that the family caregivers would like to see improved is more information about what to expect in the future um, and more information about caregiving in the event of having COVID. Next slide, please. We also asked our family caregivers about COVID information sources. Where were they or are they seeking information about the disease? Um, as you can see, not unexpected, the vast majority uh, were using television uh, conversations with family and friends and websites as sources of information for COVID. We had an interesting demographic split of, across ages about sources. Um, older caregivers were using the more traditional media sources while younger caregivers were using more traditional online sources to access information. The surprising information we had here, 79% of all our respondents reported they occasionally or never used a healthcare provider as an information source. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 visiting restrictions for family caregivers who had a person living in long-term care were very much a challenge. 
Um, it's important to point out as I share some of these resources that as the family caregivers expressed concern and frustration about visiting uh, restrictions, they also talked a lot about what we thematically have identified as caregiver gratitude. Um, these family members are so grateful to the care providers in the organizations who are trying to juggle COVID, COVID restrictions, changing public health messages, changing measures, and trying to provide a significant amount of care. Um, so there's a significant degree of um, gratitude. The frustration I, I'm going to share with you from these individuals reflects the public health measures that people were trying to maneuver around. 46% um, of the individuals felt the restrictions went too far. 97% um, of our respondents said that the restrictions had negatively impacted them. But on, on a brighter side, 84% in, in thinking of future solutions are willing to undertake training in PPE and infection control um, to help continue their access to persons living with dementia. Um, the other thing that was very difficult for the individuals who have um, a person living with dementia is the mechanisms of care visitation that were provided and, and how organizations tried to facilitate it often didn't work well um, for individuals who had severe dementia or hearing loss or vision loss. So while attempting to try something successful, unfortunately for these individuals, it wasn't as successful. Next slide, please. The resources during is, uh, is certainly echoes what our colleagues at the University of Alberta just spoke to. The resources use um, is absolutely uh, declined significantly. Family caregivers are using an average of five resources prior to the pandemic and only 1.6 during the pandemic. Um, transportation, day programs, support groups, um, those are all identified as significantly large reductions in access. Um, and it, it really a summary of, of what our, our University of Alberta colleagues mentioned that the, the lack of critical respite service was very difficult for the family care providers. Next slide, please. Specifically to outcome, outcomes for the family caregivers, 61% of them reported high levels of burden, 69% reported feeling socially isolated, and 55% reported a reduction in the quality of their life. Next slide, please. The concerns across the care continuum very much mirror, on, mirror and echo the University of Alberta findings. Um, for community family caregivers, there's an increase in social isolation, isolation excuse me, for the caregiving dyad. The lack of respite and supportive resources were challenging. Um, and there was a very, very significant concern over who would care for the individual's person living with dementia if they, the family caregiver, actually became ill. Um, and then for family caregivers whose family member lived in either long-term care or supportive living, the concern and anxiety was very high over the public health measures regarding access and the unknown. Um, they were all very sad to miss time with the people they loved and wanted to be able to provide the personal level of care and attention that they normally could do to their family member. Next slide, please. The outcomes for the persons living with dementia were equally as challenged with three quarters of our respondents reporting that their person living with dementia had had an increased level of responsive behavior. Social isolation for that person in long-term care or supported living was identified as a significant factor in the decline of the wellness for the person living with dementia. Next slide, please. So from our study, our significant conclusions, um, first and foremost, is our family caregivers have reported a significant increase in their caregiving responsibility at the same time that resources have been reduced. And that's a very unsustainable model. The family caregivers are overburdened and undersupported. Um, and many of the persons living with dementia have experienced decline in their wellness and function as a result of the pandemic-related public health measures. So as the COVID-19 cases continue to rise, this vulnerable population needs to be specifically addressed and thought of as health measures are revised, um, re-implemented or altered for the coming months as, as our case counts continue to astronomically increase in our province. Next slide, please. These two infographics are just an example of information that we were very, very excited to uh, be part of an advocacy um, a reach out to Dr. Henshaw from the Dementia Network Calgary. Um, the infographic on the left were our policy recommendations for ways to think differently about access to individuals with dementia in the, in the event of increased uh, COVID case numbers. 
And then the infographic on the right was simply trying to capture thematically the themes that our family caregivers had shown us um, during the survey. Next slide, please. For our research team, our next steps, we've completed our phase one Calgary pilot. Um, we're launching a phase two Alberta study this winter um, in order to ensure that the experiences of the Calgary um, caregivers is, is the same or different and, and we'll, what do we not know about the rest of the province. And then that will inform a future study um, to look at the high outcome provinces um, for COVID case counts in the country. Um, next slide, please. So we want to, as a research team, um, for many of us, we've all been touched with dementia in our family and it's a very important level that we're all very passionate about. Um, so we wanna start by saying thank you to all the family caregivers that were part of our survey. Um, thank you to the family caregivers that were part of our online focus groups. Um, thank you for sharing your personal information and your stories. They moved our team immensely and we thank you um, more than you'll ever know. Um, we'd also like to thank our partners. Um, we could not have done this without the financial support of the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary and um, without the day-to-day -day support of the Dementia Network of Calgary. So we're very grateful to um, our two support organizations. And we'd also like to give a shout out to our community advisory group to thank all of the members there who helped guide us through the survey design, interpretation, data, creating focus group questions and such. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our research. Thank you so much, Deirdre and um, Gwen, uh, everyone. It's just, it's been really, really wonderful what you've contributed. Um, I've been having some conversations in the chat box over here on the side with a few people around this issue of caregiver burnout, especially in rural areas. And that um, someone highlighted that their caregivers don't even feel like accessing the support is gonna help them at this point. They're, they're a little, they're feeling a little hopeless almost, it sounds like. so. Um, I think the, the things that you all brought up from your research are really important for us to discuss as a group and, and how can we move the dial and, and impact and make a change, right? So let's open up to Q&A. Liz, I believe, are you moderating Q&A or am I doing that? <laughs> I will bring uh, to your attention uh, when people have their hands up so you know who's uh, the order. And I know okay. that Tristan will bring up uh, questions that come up in the chat box, but uh, please okay. yes. You go ahead and, and, and moderate that. All right. Um, there is a question here from Bina. Uh, do, do you also include indirect care responsibility in the level of stress, such as connecting with services, organizing for services, and advocacy? I don't know who that's not directed to a specific person. Um, I don't know if that's related to the dementia caregivers or family caregivers. So Deirdre, you just spoke. Why don't you speak to, uh, or Gwen, speak to that question around dementia caregivers and then maybe Sharon or Jasmine can discuss that in caregiving overall. Thank you for that question. I would say for the family caregivers, um, for people living with dementia, that indirect care, we definitely heard from, um, our participants about the need for care navigation, people helping them with where do I find information? How do I go? And that, that point that you made, Jonna, Jonna, about feeling overwhelmed, we heard from people that, you know, life goes on during COVID-19. So people were being newly diagnosed with dementia and they didn't know where to begin. They were, they just, they felt lost and they were like, I, I just don't know what, where to turn, what to do. And they talked about having, you know, that navigational component, if they could access one person and they could help direct them to find, you know, the information that they needed in, you know, not even knowing what was aware was very difficult for them. Yeah, we hear that uh, a lot with our clients too, that we serve at Caregivers Alberta, but that um, the frustration around navigation uh, assistance, for sure, yeah. Jasnita, Sharon, do you wanna address that indirect, um, the indirect impact of caregiving question in general? Well, even before the pandemic, um, Caregivers were, uh, 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 this is a, a study that was done um, in Canada. So caregivers are now spending 15 to 50% of their time um, trying to find services. Uh, the authors uh, call that the structural burden of care. Uh, and certainly in within that qualitative data that we've got, and we're going to analyze that even further now, um, absolutely. Navigation, feeling alone, um, and so many caregivers, you know, we're just, I, I can hardly wait for this 
you know, I'm, I'm so burned out and I'm waiting for this to, to be over. And now they're back into it again. I can't imagine what they're feeling now. And uh, I can add uh, a couple of comments uh, to try to address that question. And I'll refer you to some of the work done by doctors Gail Ewing and Gun Grand from UK who have validated a caregiver supports uh, needs assessment too. When it comes to caregiving, it may help us to think in terms of what caregivers need to do directly for the care recipients and what do they need to do, which was just referred to as indirectly. So direct, direct caregiving is often about hands-on care. It's about the functional needs basic functional needs of the care receiver. And yes, absolutely, family caregivers are doing a lot of that. Dressing, washing, grooming, cueing, feeding, toileting, transfer, supporting mobility, bringing in equipment, etc. But then there are things that they're doing that isn't direct hands-on care, but it has to do with still things that they have to do to address the needs of the care receivers. And that is navigating the system, managing what we call instrumental activities of daily living, which is chores and errands and other, you know, fairly ne necessary parts of our, our life, managing money, um, and one area that is particularly stressful for them is actually navigating the healthcare system. And in that particular area, caregivers are taking a lot of responsibilities. Information about the diagnosis, prognosis, how to monitor, what to monitor, how to report, deterioration or improvement, manage crisis, et cetera. So when we, and, and that's where I made a, a call out to all of you, when we are looking at how we support these needs, it's very important to individualize your interventions based on what that particular caregiver needs, that context, what is it that they need support in. So when it comes to stress, all these aspects of caregiving can cause stress. And when there's layering of these support needs, the stress increases exponentially. So let's examine what is it that caregivers need? That's where we need to move into is that interventional work, not just in service delivery, but also in research. And when we look at all the organizations around this table, we can start to look at who can do what and what can they support. But there needs to be a no wrong door approach where when a caregiver knocks on your door, you should be able to assess the needs and then read or either provide the services yourself or redirect them. And if I could just um, follow up on that, um, because you raise a really great point, Jasmine, thank you, about the, the need to assess family caregivers, because it is a each caregiving situation is different. There's no two that are the same. And it's important for the family caregivers, that assessment piece, and really considering them as part of that care unit. So assessing their needs and finding out what they need, not what we think they need. And looking at their, um, not only using the resources, um, but are the resources that they're using and that they have access to, do they have a perception of adequacy? So if they're using a particular resource, is it meeting the needs that they have? And appreciating that not all resources are created equal for all people. So one person may need something very different than another and de developing, and as you mentioned, Jasmine, tailoring those interventions and tailoring it based upon what the person needs at that time and recognizing that that could change as they progress along that caregiving trajectory or the person they're, they're caring for is progressing along the disease trajectory, that will change. So an assessment shouldn't just be a, a one and done. It should be an ongoing process.
Sorry, I was busy typing in the chat box. There are some responses. We're getting some good engagement. Um, I have a question going in the chat box about well, what are some of the very specific caregiver supports out there? And so I was responding to some of the supports that Caregivers Alberta can offer because I think we all assumed and, and probably knew um, even before your research presentations that you know our, our family caregivers across Alberta are stressed out, they are overwhelmed, they're providing more care than they were pre-COVID. Like it's a challenging, challenging time. So what are we offering within our various organizations um, to provide that additional support or help fill in the gaps or, or help uncover like what is it that would help this particular caregiver? So I'd like you all to you know, raise your hands, please comment on that very direct question to you while I say that Caregiver, Caregivers Alberta as, a, as an organization offers um, that assistance like navigating, uh, finding the resource in your area, um, finding a, an additional support through a community-based service. We offer one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching sessions with our caregiver coaches to actually have more in-depth conversations and hone in on well, how, how can you get the support that you need in your area and what would help you get there. And, and, and also looking at your wellness as a caregiver. Um, is a huge component of our around our coaching sessions. We do workshops, we do uh, all virtual stuff right now because of COVID, but we do uh, a lot of education sessions. We're getting ready to have uh, a session next week. Is that is December 2nd next week? Oh my gosh, it is. Next week, we're having a session um, about how using your own voice and the sound of your voice can promote um, healing and stress reduction. And that particular education session has garnered a ton of interest. We have over 50 registrations already. So that's an example of an out of the box type of education session that we're offering because we're trying to, to offer some of those creative solutions for things that caregivers can implement in their daily life. Um, so that was a little bit long winded. Please, someone else could jump on the mic and share. What are you aware of um, as a support mechanism for caregivers? Um, Jonah, are you asking the panelists? Thank you. I'm asking everyone. I'm actually asking. Yes, <laughs> if, you, if the panels have an answer to that, absolutely. But I, you know, we have over, we have 97 participants on this mm -hmm. call. I want to hear from some of these people that are on here too. Sure. To, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I can't see any raised hands, Liz. So I don't know if anyone's raised hands or not. I don't see any raised hands, I think. Uh, so people, you're welcome to start uh, clicking on, on that raise hand button if you'd like to hop on your mic. And uh, of course, people are very comfortable in chat. There's loads of activity going on there uh, for sharing resources. Uh, so, and I do see also in the chat, a question came up for uh, the panelists too, but uh, let's I, I finish off your question here, Jonah, Jonah. And then there is that other question that did come in that we won't wanna miss. Okay. Well, no one's jumping on the mic to share what their supports are, so maybe they're thinking about it. Um, I, go, Jonah, what? I can if if you if yep no one else is. Hi, it's uh, Nicola McFarland here from Northwest College, and I feel like we uh, work hand in hand with Caregivers Alberta, um, in that Caregivers Alberta has that how to care. Uh, and uh, for yourself and keep that resilience in yourself and, and that strength mentally. And uh, they also have the how-tos and navigation and, and uh, resources. Um, on our side at Norquest, uh, we help the how-tos of, um, of the healthcare piece, uh, taking from our uh, healthcare aid and our um, uh, practical nursing program information in the scope of care and the angle of the family caregiver. We have uh, two-hour workshops that are uh, one hour of lecture and one hour of applied learning where we look at a scenario related to the topic at hand. And um, we cover nine different topics and I can put those in the chat box as well as the, uh, the uh, link to those courses. So it's meant for family caregivers who uh, feel like knowledge is power and helps them reduce their burden um, and, and knowing how to make decisions in the, the health and the, uh, the well being of their loved ones. Thank you, Nicola. Um, my name is Samantha. I can't find the raised hand button, so I apologize no worries. for interrupting. No worries. <laughs> um, I'm one of the social workers with the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. And we're here to help 
families navigate the system. So find out what resources there are available. Um, we don't require that there be a confirmed diagnosis to connect with uh, myself or one of the other uh, social workers in the office. Uh, we also provide online education, whether that be about the different types of dementia that um, are most predominantly diagnosed, uh, as well as like a caregiver strategies. Um, we will also follow up with caregivers as well, right? So some family caregivers seem to be doing really well and don't necessarily want us to follow up with them. Um, but in conversation with other caregivers, we can maybe hear that they might need a little extra support. And so we'll check in with them on a more regular basis. Um, we're also running four support groups, um, all of which are full <laughs> right now, unfortunately. Um, but we're here as a safe place for people to vent as well, right? I think a lot of the times, especially when it comes to dementia, um, family and friends don't necessarily always understand the complexities of being that caregiver. Um, and so caregivers often need a safe place where they can share how they're feeling about that caregiver journey, whether it be good or bad. Um, and so we're here as a support uh, to walk alongside the caregiver. Um, if they have questions or are looking for resources, we're definitely there to go and take a look uh, and see what else we can find. Awesome, thank you, Samantha. Anyone else feel free to just bring yourself off mute if you haven't found the, uh, Hello, the resources. Uh, my name is Padma. I'm a learning specialist, again, with the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. Just like uh, Samantha, my colleague who spoke before, I was looking for the chat for the raised hand and couldn't find it. So sorry about that. So that's why it took me long to uh, actually uh, connect to you. But um, in addition to all the resources that uh, Sam, uh, Samantha mentioned, we have also been uh, running our day programs virtually. Uh, so we are the only day program that's been providing uh, day uh, programs, activities for uh, persons living with dementia uh, um, so five days of the week. And also we, are, we have been doing Facebook chats regularly every week uh, with social workers and also with the experts in the dementia care field um, twice, I mean, once every two weeks. So these are the additional um, supports that we have been providing. And also we hired an additional social worker to uh, add to our team uh, to take all the extra calls that we were uh, receiving from caregivers to provide them the support that they absolutely needed this time. So that's all for me. Hello. My name is Monica. Um, I am part of a travel uh, family. And um, we are a private, we are the only private site in Charwell here in Alberta that can help families who has uh, somebody with uh, dementia. And we have the memory living site that is totally private. They are right now because of COVID and everything, because for them it's harder even than for us because they don't know what is the next day and it's gonna be the same. So we has been make a bubble for them and they, they can be socializing because we all know here that sociabilization for patients, for people living with dementia is really, really important. So uh, it's a solution and a, for, because right now I know Alberta Health System, they don't want to move anybody from one side to the other. But socialization for patients with, and even for seniors, is really a must. And uh, well, we are here as a solution. Whatever you, you, you have it, we have different solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And then also, um, I was chatting with somebody over here in the side box about um, adult day, day programs um, that are going on in rural areas, especially that many of those are still active. They're active through Zoom sessions, through group sessions, and they're even doing one-on-one -on -one home visits. So for those of you, you know, in various areas around the province, um, you know, check, check in about those adult day programs because that is a huge system of support for family caregivers. I know that we Caregivers Alberta has partnered with Elder Care Edmonton, which is an adult day program. Um, 
organization and they we're doing virtual day programs again so that there is an issue with a technology divide between some clients because not everybody has that access but for those who do uh the organizations there's lots of organizations like us who are attempting to offer more and more during this time of covid so just wanted to give that shout out and anyone else want to come on this is sylvia tier i'm in calgary i'm a I, i'm a family caregiver my husband has um has dementia I just wanted to give a shout out to the great support that that uh, the dementia team of Calgary South um, Home Care provides as well as the Club 36 through the Alzheimer's Society we were we were in the day program which we're missing terribly and just can hardly wait that, till the day program my husband will stand at the door and say how do we get out of here you know, needs to be able to go somewhere. Um, but they're providing a, a Zoom session every day, an hour every day. And it's quite, it's, they're varied and, and quite interesting. So just, uh, just a shout out to them. But I do want to know whether anyone uh, has ever asked the question of Blue Cross about providing for some insurance for um, at-home caregiving. I needed to have help during the early days of, of, um, of COVID. Uh, my husband was in a, um, a um, delirium state. And after five nights of not sleeping, I needed help. And home care only, only works from seven to 10. So night times were not available. Um, I got some private um, caregivers to come in at night, the, the cost was over $5,000. And I then tried, I have um, on my Blue Cross, I have caregiver um, insurance, but only if it's given by a licensed LPN or registered nurse. And for supervision for safety at night, I didn't need a registered nurse, I needed a caregiver. so. I'm wondering if there, if anyone has ever talked to Blue Cross to see if, if they would consider um, looking at something like that. Thank you for this session. It's been excellent. That's an excellent question. Anybody want to comment on that? And uh, while people may be commenting on the chat box, this is Liz here. I'll just uh, note that uh, for people sharing resources and for people asking questions like, like the one that was just asked, uh, when we go over the core uh, group and the functionality there for people to be able to upload resources and engaging in discussions like this um, offline, and that, that would be, that's also a, a great resource. Um, and I believe Bonnie had her hand up, but Bonnie Hoffman and... Uh, I'm not sure if she still wanted to speak, but I did. Bonnie, I was, you're on mute on. if you did want to say something. There you go. Yep. I, yeah, I was muted. Good morning, everyone. This has been a really great session. Um, I am Bonnie Hoffman, and I operate a small um, licensed funeral home in the Edmonton area. And I'd like to preface that with I left my other job to open a funeral home um, in order that I would be able to provide education and resources to families who are looking at end of life planning. I think that the funeral industry and um, healthcare have not, we don't communicate well and families are often um, searching for end of life planning and resources. Um, I would like to mention though that my other job was for several years with Caregivers Alberta. And so I, I um, you know, I, I feel like I uh, really understand the journey of family caregivers. And now that I am working in end of life planning and death care, um, I see even more how often families are looking for planning information and tools, but don't even know how to begin asking the questions. And so I, um, as, a, uh, as an educator, I'm really interested in helping families figure out what it is that they need, what they can do, how does it work, how do we process um, when death occurs. We don't talk about that very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes, thank you. 
I wanted to highlight a resource that uh, Shannon um, brought up from the Calgary Seniors Resource Society. They have a variety of fundings for seniors. She put this in the chat box too, so everyone can find the link. But they have a program for seniors that volunteers lead in the community. One of them is called Caring Companion, where a volunteer provides respite for a senior, allowing a caregiver to have a break each week. So referrals can be made directly via phone or their website. Again, Shannon has put this information in the chat box. And uh, that's with the Calgary Seniors Resource Society, uh, calgaryseniors.org. So check into that. Um, the family caregiver's own family doctor can be a source of support. Uh, most primary care networks have a variety of additional supports. Um, the Elaine Muncie put, put in programs that um, the organization in Calgary, Hospice Calgary offers. They have community services, they have weekly support groups now serving Southern Alberta on Zoom. Um, so they have a variety of support mechanisms in place. Anyone else want to jump on the mic? Hi, this is Yuresh, I'm a social worker at the University of Alberta Hospital. I just wanted to respond to some of the questions. I believe she's a caregiver that was looking for additional uh, funding for um, help for her husband at home. Um, I'm not sure that Alberta Blue Cross would offer something, but I, and I can't be certain about this 100%, but it might be worth exploring Alberta Seniors Benefit, looking at their website. They have different kinds of funding, and so I don't know if they have something like for that specifically, but it might be worth exploring, so just a suggestion. Thank you for that, awesome, thank you. Donna, I'm not sure if you see, but Lisa Bassisti has her hand up. Okay, no, I, I can't see any hands, so you'll have to call that one out. Hi, I'm Lisa Basisti. I'm coordinator of primary care in the North Zone. And so I work with the primary care, care networks in the North Zone and the Aspen uh, PCN, um, as, as you already mentioned, though, is one of those places that, um, you know, would have uh, some, some avenues of support there for people. Um, within that um, Aspen, we have a program that uh, we're trying to really get off the ground here and we've had one session and then COVID hit. So just a really neat concept that we've kind of developed here through an innovations grant through Alberta Health Services is what's called the dinner club. And so when we can go back to the pre-COVID or post-COVID ways, I guess, what we have is we have once a month where we are getting together with people um, who are caregivers and their their, their loved one who has dementia or is vulnerable, uh, lonely, and so forth in the community, uh, meeting in a hall. And we have one part of the session is with a recreation therapist planning a program. And then the second part is actually having, um, it was a home style meal that we had provided for them. And people sat around a, a table of six and, and had some little bit of supports from each other. And then there was a little bit of entertainment, either through music, or it was a speaker and and that was one of the sessions that uh, that was going over very well so we have that coming up uh, hopefully in the spring again we also have uh, community connectors here with FCSS which is a program that is just brand new and we have some volunteers in the community that have um, if anybody has uh, a need to to speak with somebody or just wants to just to, just to chat, we have some volunteers in the community that work with the community connectors, and they are able to go and and meet as well. There is also um, uh, you know talk about having a death cafe. Um, we have a very uh, a former uh, registered nurse who is a volunteer now with um, some of our working groups within seniors, and she has talked about a death cafe and bringing that out into the community. We actually had a presentation about a year ago from her. Um, and it was really interesting because the death cafe or talking about death and dying um, was something that nobody, a lot of people just didn't know. They didn't want to come to this presentation. They were so uplifted at the end that I think that it will be something that we'll be looking at more in the future. And then we also have the adult day program, which calls are being made on a regular basis. And just for those that don't know, there is a program called Seniors Without Walls, which is within South side uh, PCN, I believe it is. And anybody within the province can join in and they have regular activities during the day for people to call in. So it's another way to, uh, to meet. And then the last thing is we have within the community of Westlock, um, because it's more high
entire population of seniors is we have a Voices of Seniors group, which is an advocacy group that is very vocal in our community. So it, it is something that if you want more information, you can certainly reach out to myself and I can get you in the right direction. Thank you so much for everyone who's hopping on the mic. I'm going to uh, pivot over to my colleague, Tristan. She's been carefully monitoring the chat box for questions. Are there any questions we've missed, Tristan, that we need to address? Yeah, there were a few for the panelists. Um, I have three here. One of them is, I suspect the stress and isolation may be even higher in immigrant families. Do you have any comments? Um, yes, uh, we can presume that that's the case. However, we did not explore that in our survey, but we plan to in the follow-up survey. And I'm very grateful for, to everyone who has been in the chat box adding uh, suggestions for the follow-up survey. We are capturing them. Thank you. And our, for our survey as well, we um, didn't specifically look at that. We did look at different um, categories of family caregivers. But in our next study, we really want, really do want to capture like this unique challenges, depending on which group you're in, as well as looking at family caregivers in the rural area, suburban, the um, remote areas, the, to see what's going on with them as well, because we do know that there's a large difference between those that are rural and those that are urban. So trying to, you know, get at those different niches that are um, need our support. And if I may comment, it may it may sound confusing. All these various surveys going on, yeah. however, uh, there is there is a need for um, carrying out surveys with the different populations of family caregivers, uh, because what tends to happen is that we, we treat family caregivers as a homogenous population. So I'm very grateful Gwen and Deidre are doing this work in dementia. Um, there's Dr. Matthias Hoban, who's looking, exploring caregiver um, uh, issues and needs uh, of caregivers. Who, who's um, uh, uh, um, the, where the care receivers are living in designated supportive living. So yet again, a very unique area which has actually been under-examined, under-explored, which needs our attention. So please, if your input and advice to all of us makes our research just that much better. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for that. I do have another question. Um, Brenda said, I was wondering if there was any findings about a correlation with increasing risk of elder abuse and increasing caregiver stress. Absolutely. There, there is uh, no question. There evidence, we, we've had previous evidence um, on um, where um, caregiving um, can cause considerable stress and with certain elements already in play, which we call contributing factors, can result in elder abuse. So when we are, and, and I've worked with the elder abuse team here in Edmonton Zone, and of course being a care of the elderly physician, we have a low threshold to explore elder abuse. So when we see victims of elder abuse, we do not, um, we do not go straight to just blaming the perpetrators as being entirely responsible for what's going on. We look at what's contributing to that abuse. And of course, we look at the severity of, of the abuse before we, um, um, uh, before we decide on our counseling and interventions, et cetera. And what we always take into account is the emotional health of uh, the person who, who's supposed, responsible for the elder abuse. And we look at, in, in the case of the elderly, um, what, what, what are the caregiving responsibilities? What have they taken on that could be contributing to their stress and affecting their mental health? And you'd be amazed at um, how much, how many of these people actually love the person they are caring for and want to do a good job to care. However, because of overwhelming stress or their inability to cope or, or other contributing factors such as financial or previous mental health problems, et cetera, um, cause harm. 
So um, absolutely, when you are looking at any victims of elder abuse at the hands of caregivers, please take that approach with the family caregivers and explore what do they need? What is going on in their lives that may have contributed to the abuse to see if you can support them? Because by and large, most people who are victims of elder abuse still want to continue living with the people who may be causing the harm. Thank you. Thank you for all those questions. We have run out of time. I just want everyone to know you will re be receiving a follow-up email after this listing information, contact information for each of our speakers and our panelists. So uh, we didn't get to all the questions that Tristan had pulled out of the chat. Um, you can do some direct follow-up with us through that uh, follow-up email. You'll be getting all those links. It will also list information about the launch of the core care caregivers group and asking for your feedback on the event. So we, we hope you will join the core caregivers group uh, to explore the shared resources and partake in the discussion. If you're interested in knowing more about our Air Alberta Caregivers Focus Coalition I mentioned, you'll see link to that information as well. And if you have caregivers uh, in your client base who need more one-on-one -on -one support, I think we just got um, a lot of people who shared some resources for us. So, and with that, I will close our session today and say thank you, thank you so much to our presenters for, for your wonderful um, presentations and thank you to everyone who shared a question, shared a comment and, and brought up some discussion today. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone. We'll see you encore. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you all later. Have a wonderful rest of the week.